I think I need to just start, but just if you would just bow your heads with me for a moment. God, we love you tonight. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here right now. Thank you for John Piper and this great effort he's putting forth. Thank you for his life in the inner city. Thank you for all those who've gathered here tonight. And God, we just pray that your spirit would rest here tonight. Rule every heart, every mind. Take control. Change hearts. Change minds. Heal brokenness. Heal hurt. Heal anger. Heal those pains tonight. I know you can do it. You did it for me. Thank you, God. Amen. I had to do that because, you know, but, uh, Pastor John opened up something. I need you to know that um, there are at least seven people here at the church who have read the book, and we have been involved in discussions. But as we were involved in discussions, as he talked about what happened in South Carolina, I couldn't help but to think about Mississippi. And I don't even have enough time tonight to tell the stories. I got lots and lots of stories. But there were some things that happened early in my childhood. Growing up in a Christian family, daddy was a preacher, pastored the same little church for 45 years. I heard all of his sermons at church and in our house. He preached every Sunday before the church got it, we got it. So I had the word in me. And he was a great revivalist, evangelist, went to many cities, and I went to him to, went him to most of those places. And um, this one particular night, as he had preached in Jackson, Mississippi, and just outside of Jackson, as we were driving home to Hattiesburg, uh, in and around Hattiesburg, a little place called Blue Spring. How many people heard of Blue Spring, Mississippi? Thank you. <laughs> But on the way home, we stopped at this little hamburger stand. That's what it was, a hamburger stand, not a restaurant. They sold hamburgers and hot dogs. We stopped there, and we stood at the window for a while, and nobody came to the window and waited on us. We stood there and stood there. And I'm, I am an 11-year-old kid, and we stood there and we waited, and then it finally decided to knock on the window. And when he knocked on the window and someone finally came to the window, his exact words was, you boys need to go to the back in order to be served. And I'm standing like, my dad is a, is a preacher, an evangelist, an upright man. People respect him well. And now somebody say, you boys need to go to the back to be served. I'm like, dad, are you going to say something? And he said, let's go back and get our food. We went back to the back of this dingy looking place. And somebody, someone just handed our food out a little bit of window. And I'm upset. I'm angry as a child. I'm angry with daddy because he didn't say nothing. And because we had to just go along with this. My dad being an upstanding man and being called a boy among other names. My anger issues, my attitude was shaped at a very early age from that hamburger stand to the desegregation that took place where I had to end up going to a school where they put us in a hole in the back part of a gym, put us all in a special education class just because of our skin color. I was upset. I was angry. That's what grew up in me. I got more angry, more angry. The years went on. But God took that anger and motivated me. I'm talking about on the other side of the racism. God motivated me and I ended up, ended up becoming the principal of that school district. 
But along the way, watch this. One of those, a young man at the school who was 15 years old who was killed in a car accident was the son of one of those who mistreated me coming up. And they asked me to speak at his funeral. And I went to the church to do it. Baptist Church there in Improved, Mississippi. And I wouldn't even recognize as being a principal or a person that would speak at the funeral. The parents went to the preacher, told him I was there. He didn't even acknowledge me being there. He was not going to let a black man speak in his church. I'm a principal and a pastor. Been had been pastoring and principal for a long time, and I was, was not even allowed to speak. So you know, I'm angry. And I was going to try to get away from it when I came to Minnesota. All the way from Mississippi to Minnesota. And had even been in Minnesota a year in Rochester. And my son and my daughter went to the store one night. I won't call the name of the store. But they both came back so shaken. Because they had literally been stalked because my son got dreads in his hair and they hadn't seen his kind before. And they come home literally in tears. And I realized I still had anger issues. I left my house and literally ran to that store and demanded to see the manager and I'm all upset all up in the air. A few years later, incident happened in Duluth. Get a call from my son and say you've been harassed by a police officer. Me and my oldest son went to Duluth, Minnesota. And I realized I still had anger issues. Not only did I go down to the, to the uh, city hall, but on that college campus I did and said some things that was unbecoming for a pastor preacher. I have to tell you, that's the, that's the best I can say it right there. But I realized I had still had those anger issues that were born in me at an early age there in Mississippi, in that hole, at that hamburger stand, in that classroom that was supposed to be the same for everybody. I could not run from myself. Coming to Minnesota, I couldn't run from it. Wherever you go, you got to deal with your issues. I could not let anger keep on continuing to bring me back to that same place where I grew up and not be able to get along with white people today. That's all. I grew up with black and white. That's what I see. That's what I saw. I can stand here tonight and say to you, I love white folks. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I had to admit right here in Minnesota that I had issues. John said tonight we can hang out right now at Turtle Bread and eat a salmon sandwich together. That hadn't always been. But how many know the blood of Jesus? <laughs> Somebody ought to help me tonight. I said the blood of Jesus wash away all anger, all hatred, all the pain and I can say tonight, it no longer controls me. I got issues on the other side. But Jesus has cleansed me. And that's why I'm so happy right now to introduce you one who had the nerve, the courage, the boldness, the God in him, the Jesus in him, the Holy Ghost in him. <laughs> In order to write a book like this, in such a time as this, where our church is needed, I tried to show you the church, our schools need it, our country need it. How many know it's time to talk? In order for that to happen, I introduce you, Mr. John Piper, as he comes to us in his own way. Let's 
pray. Father in heaven, we, we, all of us, need your help. Uh, you have worked a, a great work in Pastor Russell with regard to anger, and you've worked that great work in a lot of us in different ways, and we know we haven't arrived. And so we ask for help now to be strengthened by the Spirit of God and to be faithful to the Word of God and to love the people of God and to deal with this issue in a, a wise and far-seeing and Christ-exalting way. So come and, and help me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So thank you very much, uh, Pastor Russell, for your hospitality and all of you who had any part in, in making the meal happen downstairs and putting this on. It's an honor to be with you, so thank you very much. The topic is, is bloodlines, race, cross, and the Christian. And the point, I'll just give you the main point right off the bat, is that the bloodline of Jesus is thicker and deeper and stronger than the bloodlines of race and ethnicity and family. That's the thesis. Or another way to say it, the, the blood of Christ shed for the salvation of sinners is the only power to create Christ-exalting racial harmony and diversity. And that's, that's the only kind that ultimately matters, namely the Christ-exalting kind. I'm, I don't really have anything to say to people who want to strike Christ from the equation. Because of my own uh, personal story and the unique history of our country, I will speak mostly about black-white relations, but the issue of bloodlines is massively bigger than that globally. Historically and presently, wars that are motivated by race and ethnicity are indescribable in their horrific effect in the slaughter of human life. The Armenian, Armenian genocide in Turkey in 1915, with a million people slaughtered. The Holocaust in Germany, six million. The Soviet gulag, maybe 60 million people. The massacres of Rwanda, 1994. The Japanese slaughter of six million Chinese, Indonesian, Koreans, Filipinos, and Indo-Chinese. The litany of ethnic hatred is seemingly endless in the history of the world. And today, you could just go on any website almost and type in ethnic conflicts, and you will get a long list. So, even though... That's the case. Everybody has a story, and everybody has a land and a history, and we have ours. Let me say a word about the bigger picture, though, before I launch into that story. Minorities make up about a third of the U.S. population. That 30% will be 50% by the year 2054, 2042 according to the U.S. Census Bureau, by the year 2023, that's 12 years from now, minorities will comprise more than half of all children of the United States. The Hispanic population is projected to triple from 46 million to 132 million by 2050. That will be from 15% to 30%. The black population is projected to increase 41 million, or from 41 million to 65 million, which would be from 14 to 15 percent. You may be familiar with John Mayer's um, City View report, which I find very helpful. He brings it all home to the Twin Cities. For example, the Twin Cities Hispanic population more than doubled from 1990 to 2000. We were the eighth fastest growing Hispanic city in the United States. The light rail system, as you know, 
has instructions in four languages, English, Spanish, Hmong, and Somali. The neighborhood where I live, Phillips slash Ventura neighborhood, has become, John says, the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in the country with 100, neighbor, 100 languages spoken. The Twin Cities has the largest Hmong, the largest Oromo, the largest Liberian, the largest Anuk, Anuak, Ethiopian that is, the largest Somali, <coughs> populations in the United States, and the second largest Tibetan population. And here's an interesting thing. John uh, Mayer describes what he calls the ethno-burb. Burnsville would be one. Burnsville, listen to this. This, this blows people away. It did me anyway. 29% of the kids in the Burnsville School District are non-white. Two blocks from my house, this is John talking, two blocks from my house is a Hispanic supermarket. One mile from my house is a Somali Muslim halal market. My next door neighbor is from Cambodia. Next to them is, the family, is a family from Belize. My wife's Indonesian. This is the new face of our city and our country. So that's the bigger picture that we just should be aware of so that when we talk black, white, we're not naive, like, oh, that's the only issue. It's not the only issue, it's just huge for some, right? So it gets personal. Uh, everybody has particular relationships, particular pressures, particular sins, and we need to get our feet on the ground of our real stories so that we don't talk in abstractions. Population of South Carolina in 1860, the state I grew up in, was 700,000. 420,000 of those were black, and all but 9,000 were slaves. That's 1860. That's like yesterday, historically. There was a war about that. South Carolina led the nation into it. And that war was lost by the South. April 9, 1865, the truce at Appomattox, 600,000 Americans were dead. We had killed each other like that. Ninety years later, after the truce, I was nine years old. My grandmother lived till she was 96. I mean, this is, this is not a long time. So I was nine years old in Greenville, South Carolina, and the enforced segregation that you were hearing something about was almost absolute. Drinking fountains, separate. Public restrooms, separate. Separate public schools, separate public swimming pools, separate bus seating, separate housing, separate restaurants, separate hospital waiting rooms, separate dentist waiting rooms, separate waiting rooms at the bus station, and enforced in another way, separate churches. This is where I grew up, and this is how I grew up, swimming happily in the cesspool of racism. And I can tell you from the inside, though you may not need to be told, that all the rationalized glosses, notwithstanding, it was not separate but equal. It was not respectful, it was not just, it was not loving, and therefore it was not Christ-exalting. It was ugly, and it was demeaning, and it, it, it was because of my complicity that I have much to be sorry about. And why uh, this book is really about the gospel. I owe my life to the gospel. Where, where, would, where would we be without the forgiveness of sins? Where would we be without the imputed righteousness of Jesus so that when we stand before God, we will not be punished 
though we should be. Because Jesus was punished. I mean, this is the heart of our message. This is what makes us Christian. This is what we're about in the world. So the emphasis falls heavily on the gospel. And without it, I think I would be strutting with pride or I would be paralyzed with white guilt. And the gospel has something to say about pride. And the gospel has something to say about guilt. And you don't have to strut and you don't have to be paralyzed if you know the gospel, if you've been taken captive by, by Christ. So in those years, I was manifestly and tragically a racist. And here's my definition of a racist. Uh, uh, racism is an explicit or implicit belief or practice that values one race above another. And explicit or implicit belief or practice that values one race above another. And as a teenager, I totally valued my race above black people. Totally assumed its superiority over every other race that there was. I didn't, I didn't care one whit about knowing a black person when I was growing up. Didn't care, didn't want to, except maybe Lucy. Lucy was the maid. So you see the movie Help, right? So we all, we knew about that, didn't have to see a movie. Lucy came to our house on Saturdays or Tuesdays both and helped Mama clean, and everybody liked Lucy. Lucy was wonderful. <laughs> Those who, uh, I think, attempt to describe uh, slaveholders from 150 years ago as those who treated their slaves well and liked them and, in, and invited them to their ceremonies as, as though that proved something are phenomenally naive about what makes a relationship demeaning. Um, yeah, we, we liked Lucy, and we were nice to Lucy. We had affections for Lucy, and we would even attend certain celebrations that each other had. Lucy wasn't a slave, and we loved Lucy. My sister, my mother, invited Lucy to my sister's wedding, and we were astonished that she came, and she came with her whole family. This is... Uh, a Baptist church, just like the one Billy Russell couldn't preach in. And, and uh, I was an usher, and I was 16 years old. No black person ever stepped in this church. And on a Wednesday night, this church had acted to say no one can. Because the only reason they'd come is to make trouble, and you shouldn't make trouble in the house of God. And so tell them they can't come, because they're only here to make trouble, and that's not a good reason to be in church. So that was a nice way to make a rule. So she shows up in the foyer and uh, ushers all looked at each other and, and they all looked to me like I was supposed to do something. And then somebody told me, seat them in the balcony. Nobody had ever been in the balcony in this church in the history of the church. I didn't even know if there were pews up there. I'd never been up there. There were two stairways and as I, in a kind of panic, decided, okay, they told me to do that. I suppose that's what I should do. My mother, Yankee, fundamentalist, fiery mother, comes and takes them off my arm and marches them right into the sanctuary, seats them herself. Being nice and having strong affections for 
people is the way you treat your dogs, too. My affection for Lucy did not provide the slightest restraint on my racist mouth when I was with my friends. My demeaning attitude, I want to make really clear because my parents are dead now and aren't here to defend themselves, was not their fault. I mean, they weren't perfect, but my mother washed my mouth out with soap, literally, in a pink sink. When I said to my sister, shut up, if she had known what I was saying among my friends, she would have washed it out with gasoline. God in his mercy didn't leave me there and sowed over the next decades seeds of deliverance. And I'm just going to mention a few of those so that you can join me and Pastor Russell in praising God for deliverances. I've already told you one of them, my sister's wedding. That made a walloping impact on me, that my mother would not join in this. And, and offended everybody except Lucy, I suppose. So that stuck. I just have never forgotten it. I love that story. She was a feisty, five foot two, gutsy, Yankee fundamentalist woman. And I thank God for her. A second moment was in college. Noel and I, my wife is sitting back here. She'll remember this went to Urbana Missions Conference, 1967, and Warren Webster, the Conservative Baptist Foreign Mission Society director, had served for, I think, 20, 25 years in Pakistan. He was on a panel at the front, and believe it or not, with 9,000 people in the audience, they took questions at microphones. And one of the questions was, uh, Mr. Webster... What if raising your daughter in Pakistan, she fell in love with a Pakistani? How would you deal with that if they wanted to get married? And as far as I can remember, he didn't miss a beat. And he said, better a Christian Pakistani than a white, rich, American, unbelieving banker. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, that was exactly the right answer. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't what I was expecting. The bloodline of Jesus, in other words, is thicker than American bloodline or white bloodline or Pakistani bloodline or when the two lines go like that. So that one was huge. I went off to a seminary and that issue of interracial marriage had to be settled. Now, I don't know what your attitude is towards this because this is really controversial to this very day and it is controversial politically and it's controversial personally. Politically, I don't know if you realize how fresh this is. I was a senior in college. When I was a senior in college, 16 states, it was against the law for blacks to marry whites. So I'm, a, I'm a senior in college. That's 1967. South Carolina did not remove that from its constitution until 1998. Alabama, not until the year 2000. And when a survey was taken, how the people of South Carolina felt about taking that out of the constitution, 29% didn't like it. That's 1998. So that's an issue. <laughs> that's a real live issue because 
my main or intellectual rationale for why I believed in segregation as a 15-year-old was black birds mate with black birds and white birds or red birds mate with red birds for goodness sakes. And because if, if you go to church together, or you go to school together, or you live in the same neighborhoods, you're going to fall in love with one another and you know where that leads. Marriage and you can't do that. I mean, seriously, this is, I want to say is, for many people, the bottom line issue why they're still uneasy with togetherness. You've got to settle this thing. I mean, you can settle it in different ways, but I had, in 1968 to 1971, those three years, I had to settle this. So um, I did all the research I could do and uh, read blacks on this, like this one, Lawrence Otis Graham. Interracial marriage undermines African Americans' ability to introduce our children to the black role models who accept their racial identity with pride. So blacks are opposed to it, some. And then I read white conservatives, and they go like this. We are seeing the death of the American and his replacement with a non-European type who now has enough mass in our society to pervert European and American ways. White people are going to have to struggle mightily to survive the neo-melting pot and avoid being part of the one-size-fits-all human model. Call it what it is, genocide and extinction of the white genotype. So blacks don't like it, whites don't like it. And I've got more quotes here, but you get the point. So I have come, I've preached on it twice at my church to the conviction that God not only permits, but would encourage us to positively celebrate interracial marriage in Christ, in Christ. even though there are reasons why one might write those kinds of things. What that does is pull the rug out from under all kinds of rationales for segregation, whether legal or just de facto. Because if you think we just can't do anything to encourage interracial marriage, then that will back its way up to all kinds of caution and separation. So settling that was a huge issue for me and, and to this day, um, <laughs> can't help but mention this, we just had a slideshow at our church during missions week on two Sundays and showed 100 missionary families and I was simply blown away at how many of those are mixed race families. A fourth thing God did, my wife and I spent three years in Munich, Germany, studying 15 miles to the northwest of Munich is Dachau, one of the concentration camps. Big sign outside, nie wieder, never again. Barbed wire, barrack rows, three high, triple decker, cremation furnaces, hanging rooms, shower rooms, so-called, gas, they're all still there. And you can walk through them with your mouth shut. And what, what was that? What was that? That was the belief in the evolutionary superiority of the Aryan master race. That's what it was. This was racism to the end, to the end. It made a huge impact. I'll jump way ahead. Taught for six years over at Bethel. God called me to preach, I believe, at Bethlehem down by the Metrodome. And I drove down there, not knowing where the church was in 1980, and uh, circled around the church and I looked. There's the university over there across the highway. And there's Valspar and the kind of light industrial to the north. There's those magnificent IDS Tower buildings downtown and to the south, poor, poor neighborhood. Phillips neighborhood called the poorest neighborhood in the city in those days. Um, north maybe now, I don't know. Uh, but Phillips and uh, 
now Ventura Village, which just before Fra- just above Franklin there. So Elliott Park, Ventura, Phillips, that's my neighborhood. I've lived there now. I, I said to the Lord, look, if, I'm, if you're going to call me here, I'm going to live here because I just, it feels totally inauthentic to me to be driving in from outside. And I, I, I still feel that way. So we've been there for 31 years living in Phillips' neighborhood. Phillips' neighborhood in 19, 2005, uh, <laughs> you can't get statistics on Phillips. I mean, it is so vo- mobile and so volatile that you hardly know what's what. But um, a few years ago, it was 24.6% Caucasian, 29% African American, 22% Hispanic, 11% Native American, 5.9% Asian, and uh, 7.4% other. And that's my neighborhood for 20 one years. That's where I raised my four sons and Talitha now, our daughter. And that brings me to the last step in the story before I turn to, to the gospel issues. Um, our daughter's named Talitha. She's African-American. And here's how it happened. I began preaching uh, back-to-back sermons on Sanctity of Life Sunday and Martin Luther King Sunday. I think it goes like that. So Martin Luther King Sunday comes, and then Sanctity of Life. Now, this is a, this is a, this right here, this uh, Martin Luther King, that's a Democrat issue. And this is a Republican issue. <laughs> and I like to mix people up. <laughs> and I love to keep people off balance, because I'm neither. I'm Christ's. I want to I speak, speak into the Republican sin and into the Democratic sin and I want to say, this, this is our charter, okay? We don't put names on us like that. And, and so I like mixing it up and, and, and preaching into this race issue on MLK Day and then preaching into this slaughter of our babies on the next Sunday and let the chips fall where they will. So I started doing that 17 years ago. I was, I was doing things before that, but that was the first pairing of those. Well, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but uh, those issues are in the air, pro-life, rescue babies, and racial issues, be just. We get a phone call from Phoebe Dawson, black social worker in Georgia, who's a good friend, and she says to my wife, who's on the phone, my wife is at that point, 48 years old, I'm 50. She says, uh, Noel, there's a little girl here, just born, and her mom can't keep her. I think she's for you. (laughs) And they have a little conversation about this, and Noel hangs up and informs me that there's a little girl out there that Phoebe thinks is for us. <laughs> and my first response is, I'm 50. <laughs> At 65, she'll be 15, black, and a girl. I've never raised one. <laughs> I had four boys. That, that was the gut response. So for how long did it take? No, I don't know, 10 days, two weeks, long walks in the Arboretum, asking the implications of this. And, and there were three things that, that pushed me happily over the edge. And here we are, Talitha just turned 16. So number one, my wife's heart was supremely important at this moment to me. She had longed for a daughter, right? And God gave her boys every time. And and another one would come out of the womb, and I'd say, yes, and she'd say, yes. (laughs) I love you anyway. So that was big, to watch her eyes brighten. Uh, And second, this little girl was cute. <laughs> and she was a girl, and everything starts to go. So I fell in love with her in pictures. And, and then third is the issue. The issue. And I said to myself, Lord, if we go this route for Noel and for Talitha, 
Noel had the name all picked out <laughs> before she ever came along. It will lock us in to the issue till we're dead. And, he's, and I said, he said, yep, that's the point. And I said, good, good. I want to lock it down. I don't want to ever walk away from this issue. Because the rest of what I have to say sort of has to do with how the gospel helps people not walk away from this issue. I'll tell you, it is easy to walk away from this issue. Because you talk about this, you're just going to get hurt. You try to do something to bring two together, you're not going to do it right. Somebody's going to clobber you because you did it wrong and, and uh, you just walk away. Well, you can't walk away if she's in the bedroom across the hall. So that's really good. And that was pretty, pretty much of a milestone. So those are some of the ways that God had mercy on this teenage racist who little by little was uh, awakened to something beautiful, namely racial diversity, and awakened to something horrible, namely my own sin, and to repentance, and as an ongoing way of life, it's not like, oh, I, I, uh, I discovered it, I repented, I'm not one anymore. I don't, I don't even think in those categories. It's not the way sin works. I discovered, I have grown in abhorrence, I have grown in delight, and I am growing in repentance. That would be the way I think we should think about it which makes the gospel not only a point in time, like you found it and you got saved, but a, a lovely, beautiful, magnificent power and message you live with morning by morning. And let me make really clear what I'm sure is obvious to anybody who knows Bethlehem or knows me. Though there may be some points in that story that sound kind of valiant for truth or justice or right, I don't see myself as a good example of an urban pastor. And I mean that totally, honestly. Because um, the way I have felt led to lead my life and use my time over the years means I don't have a, a lot of significant relationships with my neighbors. Our church has grown in diversity and I hope in love across those lines, but it's not a model church. It doesn't reflect in any way the proportion of diversity that's in Phillips' neighborhood, for example. So I don't come here to lift up me or to lift up Bethlehem and say, do it that way, you know, or be like that. That's just not the way um, I'm thinking. Um, I think I would have had a much more effective and immediate urban impact in our neighborhood if I had not written books and if I had not done wider speaking and had been on the streets and hobnobbed with people. Um, some people will thank me for the choices I made and some people, some very close to me, think I messed up pretty bad in those choices. So I am 65 years old. I'm going to meet Jesus real soon. Right? I'm going to stand before my judge real soon and I will give an account for how I served him and how... The choices I made either honored him or didn't. And I don't doubt that in the light of his perfect holiness someday, any, I don't think any of my actions will be completely pure in their motivation. And I expect some of them to look positively unwise in the light of his countenance. 
ones that I thought were wise. I hope that I have used my, my gifts and my calling in a wise way, but I'm, I'm saying this for this reason. My confidence before Jesus at that day does not rest there. Does yours? Like, I've made some pretty good decisions in my life. I've done racial harmony just the way it should be done. He will approve at that day. I mean, I'm mocking you if you do. You, you can hear that. You can hear that. So I'm inviting you to join me in a desperate dependence on the blood of Jesus. I, I, I'm inviting you to not say it doesn't matter and just go live like the devil. That clearly might land you in hell because it'll show you didn't love him and trust him at all. But I'm inviting you not to think in terms of your lived life as the ground where you're going to stand when you face Jesus. You're going to stand, if you stand at all, on the cross. That's where you're going to stand. You're going to, you're going to, if he says, why should I let you in here, you former racist sinner? You won't say, yeah, but I cleaned up my act. If you say that, you don't get the gospel. That's not what you're going to say. You're going to say, you, there's no reason you should let me in here in me. If you just look in me, then you, there's no way I'm going to make it. So I am expecting you to let me in here because I held on to Jesus and he held on to me. I trusted Jesus. I trusted his righteousness. I trusted his blood. And that's why I expect now to receive mercy and mercy alone. So on, only the gospel. So please don't, th this, th there are, I wrote this book not because I have a model pastor or a model church to hold up. I wrote it because I have some really profound convictions of what the Bible says. I have some really deep longings for what I want to see happen. Those are the kinds of things that drive me. And I, I'm just happy to put it out there. And if somebody wants to say, yeah, but you didn't do it well, I say, okay, that's all right. Let's, is it true? That's what, is it true? That's just, is it true? If it's true, just try to do it better. Just go ahead. Try to do it better. That's all, that's all, I, that's all I care about. I don't expect to be made much of because we've done it well at Bethlehem. It's a It's a longing. Let me say now, in the time we have left, a few more minutes, something about the, the gospel and the way it functions in this matter. And, and I want to try to point you to one chapter in particular that if you just chose to read one chapter, go home tonight and read one chapter, it would be chapter 6, and I think that's the essence and, and the unique thing I have to say, well, it's not unique, but the special thing I have to say that it isn't said as often as some things. We, there are many pointers in the Bible concerning the rightness, the goodness, the beauty, the justice, the preciousness of, of racial harmony and, and diversity. The most important one is the gospel. You know, you could, you could talk about all of us have a father in Adam. You could talk about all of us being the image of God, those kinds of things. And I'm going straight to the cross. Let me just give you a, a few texts to show you how this works. I spoke at a moody pastor's conference, and those are usually pretty, pretty racially diverse. Most racially diverse conferences I've ever been to are the moody pastor's conferences in Chicago. And I preached on racial diversity about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And the, the, the one point that I made that has come back to me as being memorable, and I, I, I hope I never tire of saying it, is racial diversity, racial harmony, racial reconciliation, whatever you want to call it, is not a social issue. It's a blood issue. And, and the reason I say that is because I know that my tribe, my evangelical, conservative, white tribe, they are suspicious of social issues. That sounds like social gospel, leading us away from Jesus and the cross. And so I'm, I'm, I'm playing to their music. 
I want to say this is not a social issue. This is a blood issue. And here's what I mean. Revelation 5, 9. You, Jesus, you, Lamb of God, were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made them a kingdom, not a bunch of kingdoms, but a kingdom and a priesthood, and they shall reign on the earth. So what did he ransom? What did he die to do? He died and he ransomed his people that are in all the peoples, all the ethnicities and all the tribes and all the races and all the languages of the world. And he's, he's gathering them by the power of the blood of Christ. That's huge if you believe in the blood of Christ. I mean, if you're a blood person, if you're an atonement person, if you're a gospel death of Christ, resurrection of Christ person, that's got to matter. Or uh, last Sunday, Bethlehem, the text was John 11, where Caiaphas says, it is better for one to die than that the whole nation should perish. And, and he means kill Jesus so the Romans won't kill us. And John reinterprets, because he says God put this in his mouth and said, it is better for one to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God scattered across the world. What does that mean? Okay, there, there's children out there. There's elect children of God among all the peoples of the world, and it says he died to gather them. So as missions goes out and the gospel is preached, this is God, by the blood of his son, gathering his elect in from all over the world. Or the way John says it in John, or the way Jesus says it in John 10, 16 is, um, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this Jewish fold. I must bring them. They will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, what's that about? That means I came for Jews, yes, yes I did, and I lay down my life for the sheep. But guess what? I've got sheep all over the world. Just like I have children all over the world in chapter 11, verse 52, I've got sheep all over the world in chapter 10, verse 16. And the key sentence is, I lay down my life for them. This is a blood issue. This is a why Jesus died issue. So that's, those are the cluster of texts. And you all know Ephesians 2, that we, we're all reconciled in one body through the cross. Cross, death, blood, there it is again. Or you get that amazing justification doctrine in chapter 3. Have you ever thought about how justification relates to multi-ethnicity? Listen to this. This is Romans 3.27 following. God put forward as a propitiation Christ by his blood to be received by faith. What then becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God a God of the Jews only? Now, this, the logic here is really at first, like, whoa, where'd that come from? It, it, we're justified by faith, or is God a God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles, the nations also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. So here's what he's saying. I have sent my son into the world to provide a righteousness that no human being can provide on their own. There's one way to get it, and it isn't Jewishness. It isn't white, it isn't black, it's faith. Because I'm one, and there will be one way into fellowship with me, namely faith in Jesus. So right at the heart of the doctrine of justification by faith on the basis of the blood of Jesus is God saying, I did it that way because there's a unity in me. I mean there to be a unity in the way of salvation. And that means I mean to gather people of every stripe because those stripes don't matter. 
Now, this is where, right here in the, in the message is where I think most preaching on racial harmony stops. Be a good place to stop. I mean, yeah. yes. I mean, who would be disappointed if I said, let's pray, let's pray. And I mean, who would say, hey, you missed the point, or I mean, you didn't get to the cross, or you didn't stress. So why, why not stop now? And so that's, I'm going to chapter 6. Um, let me see if I can help you feel what I feel about this and um, give you a few examples. So I've been trying to talk about race ever since the Lord convicted me at Wheaton, see, in my later teenage years, trying to think and come to Bethlehem and live in a diverse place and more and more try to just figure out what should we do and how to think about it. And, and I, I feel like the main things I've learned is about process, about what happens when you make an effort to think a certain way or do a certain thing. And uh, what happens is uh, you get in trouble or you get hurt, you get discouraged, you get wounded, you get criticized. And, and if something doesn't happen, you just say, I'll take my ball and go home. I'm just going to quit because if, 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 if my efforts don't count any more than that, then I tried and I just think there are millions, maybe that's an overstatement, thousands of evangelicals who've said, I tried that racial harmony thing. I tried that. And I got shut down over and over. I'm just done with that issue. I'm done. What is needed at that point? The gospel is needed. That's why we're not done. That's why the sermon shouldn't end here. Like, like establishing that it's a good thing and that God wills it and the cross bought it, that's great. That's great. Now, now what? A life. <laughs> now a life. Uh, to, working that out and trying to figure out how do you keep working it out for 10, 20, 30, 40 years? How do you keep on doing it? What are the things that keep you from doing it? So that chapter, I got nine of them, and there should be more. I mean, somebody's going to come in and say, why don't you include this? I said, well, I'm fallible. I'm sinful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I've got nine of them. I've got nine of them, and let me just mention maybe three, and then we'll stop, okay? I'll, I'll name them all. Satan, guilt, um, pride, hopelessness, feelings of inferiority and self-doubt, greed, hate, fear, apathy. What do you do when these things are inside of you? Not just coming at you, but inside of you. What do you do? I mean, you told us a story of long anger. You were born again. You were born again, child of God, taken by anger. And the gospel did some more work. Now, everybody in this room needs some more work. So let me just talk about the first three. Satan. Satan and race. You ever read a book on that? We need one. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's a relationship ruiner. And guess what? He's strong. He's supernatural. He's stronger than a billion people. You can't defeat him on your own. You're just a human. He's Lucifer. Good night. You don't have a snowball's chance in his hell. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to read your Bible. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Thank you very much. This is the Bible people. I feel he's, he's already on his heels, Satan that is. Or you read, through death, Jesus destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Or you read Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. Our only hope is to defeat him by the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. 
So you just stir that into the racial harmony, racial diversity mix. What are you going to get? You're going to get total satanic chaos and lying and murderous attitudes and mean-spiritedness and ugly and distortion unless the gospel, the blood, is killing him right and left. That's number one. Number two, guilt. This is huge. This is a huge player in the black-white discussion. I mean, there are whole books on this. Shelby Steele, for example, whole books on this. It's huge, and it's deadly when it's denied. Like, I don't have any. I don't have any guilt. It's huge, and it's deadly when it's wallowed in. Oh, it's all I have is guilt. I'm just guilty. It's, you just wallow. It's huge, and it's deadly when it's wallowed in, and it's huge, and it's deadly when it's exploited. By blacks. So denial drives it below the surface where it creates endless illusions and self-justifications. Wallowing in it produces phony humility and obsequiousness and moral cowardice. And exploiting it gives false sense of power and turns out to be a weapon of weakness. This guilt thing is just massive. In this, in this whole issue and discussion, what does the gospel bring to us? Not denial, not wallowing, and not exploiting. Those are, there's no future for this debate. No future for this discussion. No future for our harmony and diversity in those paths. Christ died for our sins. He himself bore our sin in the body on the tree. Christ suffered once for sins. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Everyone who believes in him believes, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. There is no other savior to help us with our guilt than Christ. So let me just imagine with you what... Who can begin to calculate the effect of white and black from all persuasions and all parties suddenly delivered from the crushing burden of guilt? No more denial, no more wallowing, no more exploiting. What an unimaginable transformation would come. It's incalculable what the personal, relational dynamics would look like in all of our relational, racial relations if we were set free with overflowing joy and gratitude from our guilt. One more, pride. God hates pride. Listen to Isaiah 2. The Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. God hates pride, and pride is underneath everything else. It's probably the worst and most insidious and most pervasive sin in, in our lives, my life. He hates it. It, may be, it, lo- it looks different in all kinds of ways. You think it only looks one way. It doesn't look just one way. It looks all kinds of ways. It may try to look cool in order to intimidate others. It may try to be meek and retiring for fear of offending others. It can look strong. It can look weak. In either case, it's consumed with self. And what a s- select group of others are going to think about self Racial tensions are rife with pride. The pride of white supremacy, the pride of black power, the pride of intellectual analysis, the pride of anti-intellectual scorn, the pride of loud verbal attack, the pride of despising silence, the pride of feeling secure, the pride that masks fear, the pride that Hold sway, wherever pride holds sway, there's no hope for the kind of listening and patience and understanding that this kind of conversation requires. The gospel of Jesus breaks the power of pride. It reveals first, very painfully, 
the magnitude and ugliness of it. If you've never seen the ugliness of your own pride, you need to be concerned. Before the cross heals, it reveals. And what it reveals is the need of the cross. And, and the cross didn't die for your hangnail. Jesus didn't die. It's something way more serious than that. And at the root of it in all of us is pride. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, shatters pride. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should. So what's the point of by grace through faith? No boasting. That's the point. That's what the verse says. He, he set it up by grace so that we couldn't say it was by me. He set it up by faith because faith is just not doing anything but trusting. Faith is humble and grace shatters everything but humility. So the gospel comes in to pride and it reveals its ugliness as it exalts itself against God and it offers salvation and humility and love and service. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So imagine what race relations, racial controversies would look like if the participants were dead to pride and deeply humble before God. The other uh, six are hopelessness, uh, feelings of inferiority and self-doubt, greed, hate, fear, apathy. And my argument in that chapter is that the gospel is the only remedy for a Christ-exalting solution to those sins that keep us from making progress in loving each other and enjoying diversity and harmony in the body of Christ. If I can be of any use in the progress of racial and ethnic peace, uh, I think it will be this, pointing people relentlessly to the fullness of the work of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's all I have. I don't have a track record that is ideal. I don't have a church that's ideal. I don't have a family that's ideal. And so I, I'm not preaching myself. I'm pointing away from myself to what I believe is the only hope for our diversity and our harmony. Let me pray and then we'll do some Q&A. Father, I thank you for these friends and their kindness in listening. And I ask that you take everything that was true and confirm it, anything that's been skewed or false or imbalanced, and correct it. And I pray that uh, this church would be blessed, the hundreds of churches that may be represented in those who hear would be helped along their way, and that we would all grow in grace in the knowledge of Christ, in love for one another, in respect for one another, and that a ripple effect out from this moment would be for the healing of the nations. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.